Hello everyone, welcome to Civic History, happy Coronation Day. Uh, I have a special video for you today as it is the coronation of King Charles III. I know this is probably what you're hoping for, a uh, long-winded video on the protectorate of Great Britain, of, sorry, of Scotland, England, and Wales, and Ireland. But unfortunately not, we're not going to be talking about Ollie Cromwell and the protectorate. We will instead be talking about King William the Third and King William the Fourth, because they both actually have something in common with the new king. King William the Third is going to be like Charles was Britain's early Calvinist king. Charles, though supreme governor of the Church of England and baptized into the Anglican faith, is officially right now. A member of the Church of Scotland, which is Presbyterian and of a Calvinist orientation. King William IV also was the oldest monarch up until Charles to be coronated and wished to modernize the monarch by lowering its expenses and lowering its public, shall I say, not presence but expenditures. He also, like Charles, is planning to wear a naval uniform to his coronation. So, our story begins with when it comes to William the Third, Britain's Anglican faith. Yes, I know this is a symbol of the Episcopalian Church in the United States, but they're Anglican. They are part of the Anglican Communion. They recognize the supreme the Archbishop of Canterbury as the first among equals. And because I don't really like the Anglican churches in Britain's logo, we're using this instead. And the Roman Catholic Church. So, Britain has some issues with Catholicism. Because King Henry Tudor couldn't get his marriage annulled, he and Cardinal Wolsey just decided they were done with the church, which is fine. But many centuries later, Britain would have various red scares with Catholicism. They were finding papists around every corner. As if you watch the Philosophy Tube video, there's her great line of, Joe McCarthy's got a list of a thousand Catholics working. But yes. Britain had its things with Catholics. So, there was their fantastic story of King Char of King William. Here's, you know, his fleet of... Sorry, our story begins really with King Charles II, who was not a Catholic. Not a Catholic. Though he was seen as Catholic sympathetic because he spent a lot of time with France, but... Eh, and other reasons because his mother was Catholic, but mostly he was fine. Mostly. There were, of course, people in the church, in the parliament who were very upset about the idea of having, you know, a new monarch. There are still a lot of Republicans left over from Ali Cromwell's Commonwealth. But yes. However, King James the Second and Fifth of Scotland, we're going to call him King James the Second, was a Catholic. Also, if you're curious, this is the symbol for the British uh, Catholic Church. But he was a Catholic. He had converted while he was living in France as he was growing up. Not only was he a Catholic, he was even worse, a Catholic convert. And if you spent any time around Twitter, you know how they are. So, also around this time, he this was his first wife, and he was mostly a normal king during when he was married to his first wife. Uh, he was secretly a Catholic, they believe, at this time. He wasn't open about his Catholic faith. He'd still attend Anglican services. He'd appoint Protestants to high-ranking officials in the empire. Not empire, but in the, you know, the nation. Uh, had sort of shifted the foreign policy so far. He wasn't quite where he was near the end, where he was like openly supporting 
France and Spain. But his wife and he, I think she died. He gets remarried and he has a son, James. He has a son. He's also named James, which is confusing. I can never have too many names. But anyways, son, Catholic. There's going to be a Catholic on the throne. So Parliament has a hissy fit. They're in this midst of half Catholic hysteria. Their king's a Catholic, and now he has a son. He has an heir. Because originally they thought they could get away with it. With King James, uh, his, kept, his children kept dying in childhood, which is terrible. They're sort of like, yes, yeah, so it'll just simply pass to his brother. So what really started off the Glorious Revolution, though, was in addition to him having a Catholic son, was he kicked off seven bishops from the Anglican Church and replaced them with Catholics. And that was it. Parliament after this was just like, he has got to go. So they started doing what every good, you know, very emotionally unstable person has ever done when trying to, they went and decided to get a new job, look for a new businessman. And they had this idea. They found this Protestant guy living in Holland, or at the time it was known as the Dutch Republic or the Union of the Seven Republics or Dutchries to make it even more Oh, fun fact, apparently this is the silver symbol for Calvinist faith. I think it looks more like some, like the symbol for a Huguenot, uh, like just the Huguenot, but that's just me. So, they knew that there was this gentleman who was married to, I believe, the cousin. The British royal family at this time has a very weird family tree, even though it looks more like a hedge. But James's cousin slash niece Mary was married to the Prince of Orange who was the Prince of Holland and also like the Lord Protector of the Stadtholder was a weird position it's very hard to explain but it's like in between a monarch and a eternal not king but prince who runs a republic uh, he was married. See, there's William of Orange. There's his wife, Mary. And the most Protestant Protestant. So Parliament had an idea. What if we sent him like a letter that said, do you like me? And of course, he wrote back, yeah, why? Well, they're like, hey, bro, what if we just asked you to be our king? Huh? So they literally did that. There was this lovely gentleman here, Stanley, who, that's the way his name, his name is Stanley, who went down to Holland himself with a letter that said, hey, if you raise an army to the Netherlands, uh, raise an army in the Netherlands, you, you can just come be our king. You, you can take it. it. The crown's yours. You can have it. And of course, being offered the thing of like, and they're like, we'll think you, we think you'd be so great at the job. And of course he, you know, being the good ambitious man was like, you know, I would make a good king of Great Britain. So he did it. There's the famous painting of him departing uh, de Haug for Britain. And here's the painting of him arriving in London with his army. There was a couple of, like, battles, but they weren't really battles. It was more of, like, he showed up with his army and all of Britain's army just defected. They're like, yep, okay. Also, a John Churchill, a distant cousin of Winston Churchill, was one of the big generals who defected from uh, the Royalist forces to the Protestant forces. Also, here's a depiction of William and Mary and their good Protestant Protestantisms, all, all happy. So yes, he just basically said, I'd like to be king. I'm king now, and everyone there agreed. And there's this coronation where they were crowned co-monarchs. William did have some later in his reign after his wife Mary died, some issues with Parliament. But a lot of that became for the thing is like he wasn't British, he was Dutch. He was also trying to, this is around the time if you listen to the podcast, Hell on Earth. Um, great podcast, by the way, you should listen to it. This is where 
they talk about he's trying to force the market economy in Britain. And a lot of the traditionalists were not a big fan of that. Well, anyways, let's shift gears from court, from overthrowing Catholic monarchs to old monarchs who people weren't really that excited for. So here we have William the Fourth. This was the king in between King George the Fourth and Queen Victoria. Uh, he lived famously at what's known as the Royal Pavilion, which is a palace on the Royal Gardens, and it's in Brighton. It's where he was living when he was sir before well, his before well his brother was king. It looks very pretty. It looks very Indian inspired. Uh, but his brother died and he was made king at the ripe old age of 65 or so. I believe it was 65. It might have been 68. One of those two ages. Anyways, he was the oldest king until Charles came along. Uh, also, like Charles, he was famous for being very political. He was known to have a great sympathy towards the Whig party. Tried to mo He was a big fan of modernizing and toning down the monarchy. He actually was quite interesting. He fired all the French chefs at some of the royal palaces, which was very popular with the British people, but not people who were staying in the royal palaces because then they had British chefs all of a sudden. He also fired a lot of the German uh, like secretaries, which was very funny too because uh, William's last name was Hanover, which is famously not a British name. Uh, this was the prime minister at that time, a Whiggish liberal. Uh, you know, here's the depiction of him being the liberal king. He also, around this time, was the second person to ride in the golden carriage to the coronation. Of course, as all these coronations were, presided over by the archbishop. I can't remember who the archbishop was at this time, but here's a picture of him. I'm sure someone in the comments will tell me who he was. But yes, here is a little... A ticket to the coronation of King William the Fourth and Queen Adelaide. Uh, I don't think that's a number. I was curious if they had a price on there. Um, it was known to be a toned down thing. Didn't have as many people. Uh, he didn't wear the stupid outfit with pantaloons, which Charles isn't either. He wore the an admiral's uniform, which they did say is kind of a pain because you have to rub oil on your chest. I know that's weird, but it's, I swear that's something they do. They have the priest come, not priest, it's a reverend, come and rub holy olive oil on your chest, and that somehow signifies that you're king. But they had all the good songs of, you know, Zadok the priest and all that good stuff. And here's a little puzzle draw painting of the coronation of Queen Adelaide and King William IV. So anyways, I hope the coronation was good. I probably will not be awake early enough to really watch it. I hope you have a wonderful day. Please like, comment, subscribe, and if you're feeling generous, share with a friend. Bye. See you again soon.